Thank you, everyone. It's a holiday period. We're happy that you've joined. We're going to begin, as usual, with the summary of the parsha itself, whatever it talks about this week. But let's go right through it. So the opening of this brand new book, the book of Exodus, the book of Shemot, starts off by telling us that a previous generation has now passed away. Yaakov's sons all pass away, that whole generation. And uh, they'd be increased and become very, very strong. The Jewish people were in a very good place. Everything seemed to be going well. But a new Farah arrives and he sought a solution to this increasing Israelite problem. There was a Jew problem. So he now looks for different um, solutions. He calls slave labor upon them to prevent them from multiplying. But Kasher, as much as he inflicted them, so they multiplied and they gained strength. So the more he afflicted them, they actually became stronger. Her then instructed his Hebrew midwives that um, they should, to kill all the Jewish boys, when they're delivering the child, they should not let the child live. They were righteous. They feared Hashem. I'm just going to mute everybody. Give me a second. Okay, back to the share screen. So um, they were righteous. They didn't follow the orders of the Farparoi. And he called them in to say, how could you not follow orders? These were the orders. You have to kill them to the Jewish boys. And they said, Ki seina, these Jew Hebrew women, they deliver their babies before the midwife even arrives. So it's not that I was making a decision. I wasn't actually, we weren't actually involved. They beat us to it. And Hashem rewarded them for that. Then Paro commanded the Egyptians not only that the time of birth should they be vulnerable, but any newborn male that did not that survived the moment of birth should be cast into the Nile. Moshe Rabbeinu is born to save his life. His mother puts him in a special wicker basket that's got pitch and, and uh, waterproofing. She puts it on the Nile. Paro's daughter comes out to bathe in the Nile. And she sees a child and she says, which kind of child is going to be on the water in such a time? It must be somebody who's afraid and it must be a Hebrew kid. But she took the child as her own. And what we have next to her is um, Moshe's sister, Miriam. She sees what's going on. She comes forward and she says, I'll bring you a maidservant to nurse the child. Kara's daughter agrees, and Miriam arranges that the nurse should be none other than the mother of the child, which was Yochebet, Moshe's Rabbeinu's mother. But once he was weaned, he was now moved into the palace, and he was raised in the palace, and then he matured, and he went out, and he saw there was an Egyptian hitting another Jew, and Moshe Rabbeinu killed the Egyptian. But then it became known, and his life was in danger. He escapes to Midian. Uh, cut the long story short, he meets his, uh, the woman, the daughter of Yitro at the well, and he marries Tsipora, and they have a son, and his name is Gershom. The plight of the Jewish people back in Egypt gets worse and worse. They cried out to Hashem, who remembers them. And now back to Moshe Rabbeinu, who is now a son-in-law, a husband, in Midian, and he is shepherding the, to the flocks of Yitro. And he arrives at the mountain of Hashem, so-called because it was the mountain destined to be the mountain where the Torah would be given. It wasn't yet a mountain of importance at this stage. And at the same place where the giving of the Torah took place, that mountain, he sees a bush and the bush is burning. But what's so strange about this bush is that it keeps burning, but it doesn't get consumed by the fire. And he says, Asura Nabere, I'll move aside and I'll take a look. Why is the fire not consuming the bush? But Hashem told him once it, Hashem had got his attention that he decided to deliver the Jewish people from the Egyptian masters. The slavery is now over. But the news that Moshe Rabbeinu was not so keen on was that um, he was to go to Egypt, he was to inform the elders and now rescue them from Egypt and bring them to the land of milk and honey back to Israel. He was to ask Paro to free the Jewish people. Hashem told Moshe that Paro would ultimately smite 
uh, the, would ultimately, um, Hashem would ultimately, that Moses and Hashem would ultimately smite Egypt and that the Jewish people would live in great wealth. Hashem gave Moshe Rabbeinu three miracles to perform before the Bnei Yisrael would prove that he was sent by Hashem. Then Moshe Rabbeinu protested and he said, I'm not the right man. I, I don't have the credentials. It's not for me. I never looked for leadership and I, didn't, I don't want this position. And particularly because I don't have the capacity. I have a speech impediment. Hashem says, no, no, don't worry about your speech impediment. I'll, you'll take Aaron, your brother. He'll be your spokesperson, but you are the leader. Moshe Rabbein and his wife and two sons then head for Egypt. And then a very strange and esoteric passage in the reading tells us that he was almost um, consumed. He was almost killed. Hashem almost took the life of Moshe Rabbeinu. The commentaries explain that Moshe Rabbeinu had not yet circumcised his sons and Moshe Rabbeinu's wife realized this was the reason that Moshe Rabbeinu was being about to go through a uh, traumatic experience or maybe punished by Hashem. She rescues him by circumcising their son en route, en route to, back to Egypt. Moshe Rabbeinu has a rendezvous with Aaron and they gather the elders and they perform the various miraculous signs. Moshe and Aaron present themselves to Paro. Paro mocked them and he says, not only don't I listen to you that I won't let the Jewish people go free, I'm going to increase the load and it's going to become much worse. They were viciously beaten because they were not able to meet Paro's new demands. He intensified the slavery rather than it letting up. And this is when Moshe Rabbeinu goes back to Hashem and he says, Lama hare oisalam why have you done bad to this people? From the moment that I came to Paro, hey ra it's actually gotten worse. I'm supposed to be the leader that's going to emancipate this people. And since I got involved, it's actually gotten much worse. And Hashem responds that Paro will ultimately free the Jewish people. Don't think that this is the end of the story. This is just the beginning. Paro will ultimately have be forced to let the Jewish people go free. So that's a very eventful passage in the, in the Torah, the beginning of nationhood of the Jewish people. We shift from a book that deals with families, the families of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and now we have the birth of a nation. That is what the book of Exodus is about and the purpose of the freedom going to receive the Torah. So let's go through some of the life's messages that we can derive from a very loaded parsha, and what we can take from it. So the first thing, and I'm going to try and go quickly because I have so many things to share. I don't think I'm going to get through all my slides. I'm going to choose on the way. These are the names of the Jewish people that came down to Egypt. Shimon, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda. So the commentaries and Rashi quotes it that Hashem had really counted us in before. Why did he count them again? And this is a recurring theme in the Torah. Why does Hashem count the Jewish people? It's because he has a love for them. As a person who would have the greatest asset and would count it again and again, the diamonds, to know that they're there, to feel the presence of those diamonds. So it is Hashem counts the Jewish people like stars, which he takes out and brings them by number and by name. The counting of the Jewish people is a great connection between God and his people. The second thought on this point is that it says, Eile Shmot Bnei Israel, these are the names of the Jewish people. Could have said these are the Jewish people. And why is it so important to mention all the names? So we know that there were three reasons why the Jewish people were able to survive the exile, because they remained true to their own tradition and to their heritage and to the Torah. And specifically, they did not change Shmom, L'Shoinam, Umal Busham. They didn't change their names, they didn't change their language, and they didn't change their dress code. You know, very often we have a bit of an inferiority complex in the Galut. We not, don't want to appear to be too Jewish in our dress and in our um, names, and often we are happier to hide and conceal. But we see the importance of being noted and being seen as a Jew, because that's what we're so proud of. Joseph, we said previously, was identified as Sham Itanu Nar Ivri, even in the jailhouse. They knew he was the Jew. He didn't conceal it. He didn't hide it. And we can be very proud of our Jewish names, and we should use them whenever we can 
to identify ourselves. And Shmam Lashonam, also their language. We retain the connection to the Jewish uh, people's language and to the dress code, which even identifies ourselves externally. We have a kippah if we're a, a, a male, we have a tzitzit, we have a modesty of dress. It's clear and we look like we are a Jew and we're proud of that. The um, next point, these are the names of the Jewish people that came down to Egypt with Jacob. So we know that. We know that when they came down to Egypt, they came with Jacob. Why is it necessary to mention Ace Yaakov, Ish Uve Soibo, with Jacob they came down, each man in his household. The Chafetz Chaim on the Torah explains very beautifully that it wasn't just incidental that they came with Jacob. They brought Jacob with them. They kept Jacob with them. They thought about their father and their Zayda, Jacob. So this is very important that it is in the merit that of Yaakov being so significant in their lives that they were able to survive the Golas. It's important that we connect ourselves to our ancestors, that we're proud of our Zayda and our Elta Zayda, rather than referring to our parents or to the old people as the old man, as, as a, a lesser relevant part of our lives. So Es Yaakov means that they came down, it wasn't just incidentally with Jacob, they brought Jacob with them in every sense, physically and in their mind and in the generations to come. Jacob lived on in their minds and that was a means of survival. Now we get to, we said that there's two new uh, powers that are born this week in the reading of this week. The one is a tyrant and the one is a leader and they are diametrically opposite one from the other. The new king in Egypt has many failings and we see that the Gemara actually debates what does this new king mean? Either it means it was an actually a new king, who did not know Joseph, because he was new to the job. He arrived in the palace. He didn't know about Joseph. The second opinion in the Gemara says, no, it was the same power. He acted as if he didn't know Joseph. He forgot. He conveniently chose to exhaust from the history books of a very, very successful Egypt that survived very difficult times and became the power in the whole region because of their wealth, they conveniently forgot how it happened, that there was a Jew involved. So the second opinion says it wasn't actually a new king. It was a king with a new mindset. He had a new political objective. And in a second, he cast aside the Jews who had made their success, the, the very success uh, in, the, in the first place possible. And it's pretty clear that regardless of whether it was a new king or a new king with a new attitude, there was a denial of Jewish history, even if it happened to be a new king, um, a brand new king, a new power that arrived on the throne, it would have been impossible for him, for him not to know Joseph. Yosef had saved the country, and this was a generation later, there's no way that he wouldn't know. So the first thing of an evil despot, a tyrant, is to rearrange and to forget history. How many times has this happened to our Jewish people that we have been so much a part of the success of the cultures and the environment around us, contributed to it with Masiru, with actually giving ourselves over to the success of the country, believing that Germany was the fatherland and the source of all culture. And if we could be more German than the German, then we were more safe than we ever were in the history of the people. And it's a fallacy. You've got to realize that when it comes to evil leadership, despots, the first thing is they forget. So don't think that we can carry favor and buy the favor of the leaders and the powers of the, of the world by being less Jewish or by being so over indulging in giving and sharing for the country and that that in itself is going to succeed. That is not the source of our success, as we see with a brand new paro, either way, whichever way you learn him, he, he denied, the first thing he did was to deny history. It didn't happen. Uh, also what he said, he said that the Jewish people are planning to team up with our enemies. They're multiplying so fast that once the enemies come and attack, they'll join with the enemies and then they'll overwhelm us. This is another method of the enemies and the powers that we've had to contend with through history. They speak about possibilities that are pure conjecture, politically um, 
um, masterminded to undermine the Jew, that there's a threat that the Jews are about to take over all of Europe and they're the most powerful and they're all wealthy and everything is because of, all the ills of society is because of them and they are the biggest threat. So we have Google's Rahman Litsan, Yamach painting the picture of the Jew as the one who's going to cause the destruction of the country, which was the one country that the Jews had contributed so much to as professionals and on every front and every... So a despot denies history. He then creates the threat, the political agenda, which can curry and, and garner the forces and gather everyone together in a common enemy. It's only a politically expedient to find a common enemy. And para ticks all the boxes of a tyrant. And then he says the solution lies in exerting additional power. He says, let us deal wisely with them. There's a midrash, I'll just say it very quickly, that the first day Para himself went out with a basket and a shovel and he began to work. And he said, work is the most amazing thing. It contributes to society. I'm in, we're all in, let's all do this together. And the uh, poor, uh, hapless Jewish people who were uh, so gullible, followed Paro and did their best. They worked to their full capacity that day. At the end of the day, Paro drew a line and he got his taskmasters in and he said, okay, tally up exactly how much was produced this day when everyone was trying to prove themselves to Paro and to make nice to him. And this is the, qu the quantity that has to be delivered every single day. Now I leave, I go back to my palace and now you've set the bar for yourself and you now have to live up to that bar. I keep referring to the recurring themes of anti-Semitism in history. Sometimes we worked so hard, we set the bar. And then they said, fine, now you deliver to that bar. Not because you're choosing and not because you have an option. Now you're forced. Now, now we will exert our external pressure on you to deliver exactly to that level. So they put overseers over them to afflict them with their burdens. The, the commentaries are, are concerned why it says to afflict them with their burdens. It seems to be a double, double affliction, an affliction and a burden. And there's the famous analogy that is given about the jail that a person was um, forced to turn a handle on the wall for years. He was incarcerated, he was under the subjugated by the, the, the jailers. And all he had to do every single day was to turn the wheel. And in his mind, he thought to himself, on the other side of the wall, there's probably a mill. And every time I turn the wheel, I'm grinding flour. And the flour is feeding the people on the other side. And he, he found meaning and a mission and a purpose. Or maybe it's like a wa water and I'm, I'm, I'm pumping water up to, to, to be able to be drunk by the people of the city. And he managed year after year to turn the wheel. And then the day he was freed, he the first thing he did was run to the other side to see what was my wheel turning. And there was nothing there. And at that point he collapsed because he only kept himself alive, dreaming and believing that there was purpose. A tyrant has no purpose. It's, there's work to be done that is merely and simply to strip the people that they are oppressing of their dignity, of their humanity, and of being able to see themselves as a person. To work where there's an objective is a half a problem. To work simply to be able to satisfy the glee of an enemy that wants to undermine us, that there was burdens and there was afflictions and there was a double-edged, um, a double-barreled affliction. Because not only was the pain of work, but it was meaningless, no purpose, demeaning, simply to strip them of the human dignity. Such is the type of personality of a tyrant. That's all he thinks about is his own power. So he said that the more that they afflicted the Jewish people, the more they multiplied and they grew. There's a beautiful Midrash that says the Jewish people are compared to a leafy olive tree. And look what happens to an olive. It's marked out for harvesting while it is yet on the tree, after which it's brought down to the tree, it's beaten. 
And after it's beaten, it's brought up to the vat and it's placed on a grinding mill and it's ground and it's tied up. And then heavy stones are put on to, to, to extract the last drop of oil from the olive and it yields its oil. So it is with the Jewish people. It has happened time and time again through history, the heathens come and they've caused so much pain and suffering. They beat us, sent us from pillar to post. They imprisoned the Jewish people. They bound them with chains. They surrounded them with officers. And the last, and at last the Jewish people repent and Hashem answers them. So there is something that comes that emerges. It's, it shouldn't have to be this way. But from the most dark and difficult hours, the Jewish people have found a way to begin to shine again. They wake up and, they, and we realize that we are part of Hashem's people. So sometimes um, the kindness that comes our way is misinterpreted by us and it's lost on us. And God forbid it should never be the need that Hashem says when we do go through pain and suffering, it is only as in the case of an olive to extract the last and most precious drop of what that olive contains. If there is pain and suffering, Hashem only wants it for us to grow and to develop and to realize talent that we wouldn't have known otherwise. Now, uh, just a quick thought about the wording that it says, that they said that you will cast every Jewish boy into the river, and every daughter, now, that's the grammar of the word, and every daughter you will make live. It doesn't say, and every daughter chai will live. Will, will live. Techayun is an active form of the Hebrew verb. You will make live. You will cause them to live. And the um, Midrash tells us that what is significant over here is there was actually a, a double decree. We think the decree was against the boys and the girls were left alone. No. The one decree against the boys was death. The decree against the girls was techayun. We will make them live as Egyptians. We will give them the lifestyle. We will teach them the, 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 the method by which we live our lives. Take away their morality. Take away their commitments to values. We will determine how they will live. We will give them the culture of Egypt. And this is, again, two different types of ways that the Jewish people have been undermined through the history of the world. Sometimes it's because they've cast us into the river, which is a terrible physical consequence of hatred. And sometimes what has happened to us is that we have been embraced by the nations and, and either cajoled or forced eventually to follow the value systems that have nothing to do with our own. So how do we relate that to our own lives today? We have to obviously make sure that we defend our borders and ensure that Israel is safe and that wherever we are, there's a community that is protecting itself against, God forbid, any um, physical attack. But we also have to make sure that we don't lose the mindset of Jews, as we said before, that we are identified as Jews and that we don't elect to die another way. And that is to give up on all the value systems of ourselves, to make the most important priorities of life things that are not necessarily Jewish. We're so involved in wanting to make a living and to teach our children how to make a living, as important as that is, it's part of the Gomorrah and Kiddushin, it teaches the importance of teaching our children a trade. But we're so only involved in wanting our children to make a living, we forget to teach them how to make a life. And to make a life means that we have a morality and we have a value system and we live for purpose. We give up on all of those ideals and it only becomes an exercise in making ourselves fit in and succeed on the terms of the cultures around us, God forbid. So the, 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 the decree of Pare was a double fault. It was not only that the boys should die, in the river, it was that the girls should live as Egyptians. And we've got to think about both those dangers that confront Jewish society every single generation. The threat of physical well-being taken away from us and the threat of us participating in allowing the cultures around us, either by cajoling us and sometimes by forcing us to give up on the value systems of our Jewish people. Something to constantly be aware of the double threat that 
constantly confronts the Jewish people. Now what happens is, okay, I'm going to really have to skip. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move very quickly. So this this slide is talking about the fact that a man went from the house of Levi, and he took a daughter of Levi from the tribe of Levi. So the commentary say, where did he go? The midrash says that he went and he took counsel, and Levi, the father. Um, Amram, who is from the tribe of Levi, went and took counsel and he said, how can we bring a Jewish child into such a world? Look at this world. This world is causing the, the boys to be destroyed physically, the girls to be destroyed morally. How can we bring a child into the world? And he divorced his wife. He separated from his wife. And being a prominent person, all the men separated from their wife. They said, it is better for us not to bring a child into such an evil and painful world. And the daughter of um, Amram, the sister of Moshe Rabbeinu, said to him, look, my father, Pharaoh only decreed death on the boys, you decreeing death on, on both boys and girls. Paro is only able to do things that undermine us to the extent that he can, but here we're resolving the problem by the, by the headache by using a guillotine. If we give up, if we stop bringing children into the world, then we are destroyed from within. And the father listened to his daughter and he remarried his wife, Yochevet. And as a result of that, Moshe Rabbeinu is born. The solution to all of the problems that they were confronting. So sometimes we think we're so smart, we've got to make sure that we don't cause harm by bringing a child into the world, into such a difficult world. Who knows if that child that you would bring into the world would be the source of, 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 of savior for the entire Jewish people. So that was a, a brief interlude between Moshe Rabbeinu and uh, his, uh, between Amram, the father of Moshe, and Yochevet. Now, I see time is really running out. And as I said, I've got a lot of more things to do. I'm gonna skip this one. Um, she called his name Moshe. It's noteworthy to see that her name, Batya, who named her brother Moshe because he was drawn out of the water, um, she was the one who named him because of her kindness in standing and protecting her little brother in the water, floating in, in this uh, basket um, on, the, on the Nile. She was a schut. That is, the name that she gave for her brother was the one that stuck. Even Hashem only talked to Moshe by calling him Moshe. My father always used to emphasize again using the grammatical word, uh, conjugation of the word. Moshe, Moshe is like the Hebrew word ose, which means to do, or kore, which means, which, kore, which means to, to read. The, the, the form of the verb is present continuous. In fact, if it was to be true to the grammar, then having been plucked out of the waters, having been drawn from the waters, his name should have been Mashui, one who was drawn out. But the present continuous emphasizes that Moshe Rabbeinu was called Moshe Rabbeinu, not only because he was drawn out of the waters, but that was his role. He drew everyone else out of the water. He constantly schlepped all of those who were vulnerable out of their difficulty. That was Moshe Rabbeinu. Not only what had happened to him, but what he would bring about in the, in the, in the, for, for the entire Jewish people. Okay, the Rebbe Limelech of the Zinsk says that Moshe Rabbeinu grew up and he went out of, to his brothers and he looked and he saw their suffering. Actually, the word Vayigdal is mentioned twice. Rashi says the one was for age, he grew up, and the other one is in stature. He, he developed, he became a mature adult. But Rebbe Limelech of, of, of Lijin says so beautifully that Moshe Rabbeinu, Vayigdal, he grew up and he went out to see the plight of his brothers. He, Rebbe Limelech of Lijin says this is definitive. How do we know that he grew up? What made him an adult? How do we define somebody who is grown up? It is somebody who is able to look beyond the windowsills of your own palace 
and your own security and your own comfort and to see the plight of others. Not just that he went, he grew up and he went out. It's defining what it means to grow up. To grow up means to see the world not only as a place for your own indulgences, but to assist and to aid and to be involved in the needs of others. And therefore, I'm quoting from the Gemara, which our Gemara group learned uh, not so long ago, that Rabzeira had longevity. And they asked him, why do you merit to live so many years, Rabzeira? And he says, in my entire lifetime, I never rejoiced in the failures of others which is quite a uh, anti-climax. You want to find out why he lived so long. He didn't rejoice in the failures of others. A guy slip, walks down the street, slips on a banana peel, and he does a triple somersault, lands on his head, and a person would think it's funny. So Reb Zayda didn't laugh. Is that what we're saying? Is that is that the message for longevity, that you don't take joy in somebody else's misfortune? So the Gemara has to be understood deeper. And what the Gemara is saying is that Lo'elam, Rab Zayra, never celebrated his own celebrations as long as somebody else out there was suffering. He couldn't find a way of celebrating his own son's bar mitzvah or his daughter's wedding or events that were filled with joy. He could not allow himself to be filled completely with joy knowing that somebody out there was suffering. That is maturity. It's recognizing that our lives are bound up with those who might be vulnerable around us. I'm now going to have to choose very carefully what we're going to say. He, now, he went out of the palace. He saw that there was a, a person, an Egyptian, killing a Jew, hitting a Jew. And he looked this way and he looked that way. And he so the commentaries explained, he saw that there was no hope of any righteous person would arise from him. He was able to see till the end of time that this person who was hitting the Jew and, and, and torturing the Jew had no descendant worthy. And therefore he killed him. That's what the Medrash says. But the ethics of our father says, In a place where there is no man, strive to be a man. So by Yifen Kovakur means that he looked this way and he looked that way and he saw there was no man. He looked at a society environment where people were so broken by the burdens of their slavery, nobody was standing up for the torture of a Jew. Nobody was. When he saw that there was no man, that wasn't an excuse to say, well, nobody's doing it, why should I get involved? But Malcolm Shane Ish, if there's a situation that there is no man standing up and leading the, the, the charge and the battle cry, that's not a reason to shy away. That's a reason all the more to get involved. And that's what it's saying, that he looked right and left and he saw no man and he realized, then I have to be it. If there is no man, then it's got to be me. Okay, I'm moving on. So this is now the counterbalance to an evil despot, a new king in Egypt, a pare who bases his whole career on lies, on deceit, on, on, on conveniently forgetting the past and the contribution of the Jewish people, and then thinking about his own agendas and his own wealth, and people became worth nothing. Now, we're going to contrast that with the birth of a leader, and the leader is Moshe Rabbeinu. And, it's, and the Midrash says that both Moshe Rabbeinu and David HaMelech were tested with sheep. Do you remember when David Amelech was coronated and chosen to be the king? So the, the brothers said, no, there's nobody else. This is it. We've been through all the brothers. Yisha, the father, said, all the worthy brothers I've put before you. Um, so, so, they, so, so they can't. They said, you don't have any other sons? Yeah, we have a son. He's a shepherd. Shepherd. What kind of leader is a shepherd? So the Midrash says that David Amelech wasn't just a shepherd. When he took the sheep out to eat, there was different, um, different um, types of grass. And some the, the sheep that were the smallest could only eat the very soft grass. And the big animals could eat the, the much harder grass. So he made sure that he first took out the, 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 the weak animals, or the small animals, so that they would be able to eat. And then he brought out the next. So he knew exactly what every animal needed. And he addressed himself to the need of every one of his flock. Leadership now becomes a definition not of power, 
a lot of agendas. The leadership now becomes a method of ensuring that whom one is leading is going to have all that they require. It's a servant of the people. Moshe Rabbeinu was a servant to Am Yisrael. David Amelech we see with as a shepherd, and Moshe Rabbeinu, the Midrash goes to great pains to tell us how he was shepherding and then a sheep uh, ran away and a lamb and he chased after the lamb and eventually came to a distant place and there was water and he saw the lamb was thirsty and he said, oh, I didn't realize my lamb, my shepherd, you're thirsty. He gave the, the shepherd to drink and then he put it on the shoulders, his shoulders and he brought him all the way back. So the Midrash says that's the moment. That was the moment that God said, this is the leader of my people Israel. If he knows how to care and to be concerned about the needs of every individual sheep in his flock, that's the quantity, the, the, the quality that is required for leadership. So leadership now is a totally different uh, perspective. We have a new king and a new leader. The new king is Paro, which is about power and authority and, 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 and disdain for human life. And a leader, everything is about human life and that puts himself second to, that, to those whom he is leading. There's a total difference between power in its own right and leadership. And that we too see very often in our lives, in, in situations in life. Okay, trying to get through in the last closing moments. So he's now tending to the sheep and he sees that there's a, a, a bush and it's burning. And uh, he goes to investigate. And Hashem says, remove your shoes. The place in which you are standing is sacred ground. One of the commentaries, Rashi mentions that, um, why was it a specifically a thorn bush? It was a bush that was burning, a snare. A snare is a very humble type of bush. Why was that? A thorn bush. And Rashi says, because Hashem was saying, I am with you. God says, I am with you in your pain and your suffering. God appeared from the, the, the thorn bush to say that God too is unhappy and, and sad when, when there is this kind of pain being inflicted upon his children. But two points that are additional is the fact that he had Moshe Rabbein had to take off his shoes. Shoes is a very interesting theme in Judaism. We take off our shoes on various occasions. For example, in Yom Kippur, we don't wear shoes. On Tisha B'Av, we don't wear shoes. When they went into the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, they had to take their shoes off. And Moshe Rabbeinu, in his first encounter directly with God, and, and he's uh, told that he's the future leader, he takes off his shoes. Very briefly, shoes represent our ingenuity and our ability to isolate ourselves from the terrain. That's why we have shoes for different so situations, we have flip-flops for the beach and we have hiking shoes with very thick soles when we're going on jagged rocks and we have tennis shoes when we are playing tennis because the, 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 the ability to master the terrain is in the use of shoes. And therefore, at any time that we're much more spiritually sensitive, the shoes coming off represents our ability to take away the insulation that separates us from the terrain, that makes us feel that we are isolated from the problems that are around us. They protect us from them. And feeling the terrain, being on it, is our sensitivity in, in uh, Kedusha, in holiness, that we're aware of the terrain and that's why we take off our shoes. Second point that it says over there is that Hashem says to him, Ki amakom asher aleha admat kodesh. The place that you are standing on is holy. So um, Hasidus explains that the place that you are standing on is holy. I mean, extra words and what, what are the extra words coming to teach us? We often think that we need to be somewhere else in order to be able to achieve holiness. If you could only go on a trip somewhere and experience some kind of spiritual inspiration, if we only hear this drusha from this person, or we'll only, we always think and dream that there's something that could condition our lives to be a more spiritual life. And what Hashem is saying to Moshe Rabbeinu between the lines is, no, take your shoes off. The place that you are on is holy. Know that where you go and where you stand and where you work and where you accomplish, you create the holiness of place. Don't only be dependent on places somewhere out there that are holy. 
you have a role to play to create the holiness of the place in which you stand. You give credulence and importance to that holiness of the place that comes from you. Um, Moshe Rabbeinu's response was, and this is another ingredient of leadership, who am I that I should go to Paro? So what was the immediate response of Moshe Rabbeinu? How can I do this? This is beyond me. I'm not competent. I'm not able to do this. I cannot take, you know, imagine the politicians in America in this very contested election getting up and saying, I'm really not the guy. I'm, you, I don't have the credentials to be able to do this. How could I be so arrogant to think that I'm going to lead 400 million people and, and achieve all, all the goals? Imagine if, if all the political speeches were, were, were of that ilk. That would be a very different terrain of who's going to be chosen and who's going to be there as leaders. Moshe Rabbeinu's reaction as a leader, a leader is not looking for leadership. A leader who's looking to become a leader already implies that there's an agenda. Moshe Rabbeinu said, I, I'm not the right guy. And then Hashem responded and said, this is your sign. So the Mayana Shatel, one of the commentaries says so beautifully, this is your sign, even though Hashem gave him other signs. But this is your sign seems to imply what you just said. Yes, the very fact that you're saying that you are not worthy, that you are humble to say that you don't think you are worthy, this is your sign that I've sent you. That's why I've chosen you. That's not your deficiency. So I'm, I'm going to move on because there's uh, uh, so little time left. Um, the various signs that he said. And Moshe Rabbeinu's reason that he said was, I'm slow of speech. I don't have the tongue that is able to eloquently share whatever has to be shared. I'm the wrong emissary. I don't have the ability to communicate. Isn't that the most important ingredient of a leader is communication. And if I'm not going to be able to do get up on the television and, and uh, share a, a glamour show about myself and, and, and glib and cleverly guide myself into people's lives because I have the, the, the quick uh, slogans and the ability to, to, to sweep them off their feet, Hashem says that's not the ingredient. That I can find. If I need perfection in speech, if I, need, if I need perfection in speech, I can sort it out. I'll get Aaron, your brother will come along and we can get interpreters and we can get different ways to do it. But the fact that you are humble and not seeing yourself as, as, and you see your deficiency, that in fact might be the real method of allowing God's voice to be heard. Because Hashem didn't want it to appear that what was so convincing about God was that there was a great orator who was able to say the right words and to catch the right phrases and, and swept everyone off their feet. Moshe Rabbeinu's asset wasn't that he was a glib talker. He wasn't a great orator. That wasn't his strength. He had a deficiency in speech. But that only allowed him to be a greater vehicle of the words of God, because it had nothing to do with him. And it was seen by everybody. This is nothing to do with the power of Moshe Rabbeinu in himself. God speaks through him. That is his power. He is the perfect instrument for Hashem's power in this world. That's what makes him a leader. A self-effacing individual who can be the, the, the means by which the word of God is able to reach this world. I'm going to try and choose one more because we've run out of time. Okay, I'm going to end with this point. What happens is Moshe Rabbeinu tries to intercede on behalf of the Jewish people. Para then says, no, no, no. <laughs> Who's this God that I should even think of, of listening to him? Now, from now on, it's actually getting worse. And, and what he designed was, he said, you're going to have to meet the same quota. But instead of giving you straw, and instead of giving you bricks, and instead of giving you all the means to be able to produce the, the bricks that... that, that uh, um, that, that, that is your quota, instead of giving you all of the ingredients, I'm going to deny you the ingredients. I'm not giving you straw, I'm not giving you anything that is required to make the bricks, but make them anyway. So one of the commentaries very beautifully says, 
why was it such a complicated way of making it more difficult for the Jews? Just say to the Jews, until now you had delivered 200, from now you have to deliver 400, double the quota. Why does the Torah go to say no? The same quota, but I'm going to take away the means by which you would have been able to achieve it until now. The greatest debilitating element of, of a human being is not that we are stretched another, another, another centimeter and another meter and another day, that we are stretched beyond what we thought we were capable to do. The greatest debilitation is when we believe that we don't have the wherewithal. When we stop believing that we have the capacity to deliver, when we think that we don't have it anymore, that's the greatest debilitation of a human being. You can increase quotas sometimes and people can miraculously, incredibly stretch and do more and do more and do more and do more. But the ingredient that underlies all of that is that I believe that I have the capacity to do it. As soon as Paro broke them, he broke them psychologically. He said, not only do you have an incredible goal that you have to achieve, but I'm taking away, I'm taking away all the things that make it possible to achieve anything. Now go and do it. And that is indicative in our own lives when we have to do more and, and, and stretch lockdown another day, it's hard. And another week, it's hard. And, 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 and we don't know what the, what the president's going to be saying about lockdown. Another day is even harder. But the worst uh, weakness is if we stop believing in ourselves that we have the capacity to deal with the problem as it presents itself. If we believe we don't have the straw, then we are in a much worse off place than having to meet a double quota. So may Hashem give us all the belief in ourselves that we do. Hashem gave us and measures for us exactly what it is that we have to deal with. And we cannot be overwhelmed. And we have to have the emuna, that the faith that soon the please God soon, please God sooner than soon and sooner than April, we're going to have the ability to um, have the medication to avoid the continuation of this terrible pandemic that has taken hold of the world and South Africa and the Jewish people and, and everyone, everyone across the world. May Hashem bring healing. May he realize that we have the straw. May we realize that we have the straw and have the strength to fight on and to fight on with commitment for each other, with each other. And please God, will overcome the difficulties that presently present themselves. Thank you so much for joining everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Reva. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shkoyer. Thank you, Felicity. Thank you, Sam. Hey, Jeff, Jeff. Okay. Dean, okay. Leah. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week. You too, Reva.